With this, we come back to the problem of Hartree-Fock and we had derived the Hartree-Fock Ruthan equation as F c equal to S c e. I hope all of you have done this exercise of uh, checking that you have to write in the manner S c e and, and you cannot write in any other way. And we also wrote F in terms of the coefficient and remember that the F now everything the, the input matrices are all in terms of atomic orbitals. So, if I have integrals in terms of the atomic orbitals, I can construct f. However, f will depend on the coefficients or what we call charge density bond order matrix, which is actually related to the coefficient. So, you, I hope you remember this terminology that we define a p mu nu as a matrix which is sum over molecular orbitals i equal to n by 2, 2 times C mu i and C nu i star, something like this. So, this was the definition of the charge density bond order matrix where the summation were, was over the molecular orbitals, okay. So, now the final index molecular orbital does not appear, it is only atomic orbital and we can write the entire expression of Fock matrix in terms of uh, in f mu nu or we actually were writing f nu mu does not matter. In terms of the the 2 electron 1, one and 2 electron integrals, last time I showed you how to quickly write 1 and 2 electron integrals as well as p nu mu or p mu nu matrices, project the, the charge density bond order matrices. So, once you write, then the question is how do you solve it? I also told you the iterative method starting from a born Oppenheimer geometry, choice of basis set, okay, A mu, then you have to actually calculate the 1 and 2 electron integrals, then, then guess the p, because that is the important thing, the p depends on the coefficients, construct the Fock matrix, solve the equation, get new coefficients, construct p, again construct Fock matrix and continue to do okay, till it converges. So, that was the basic iteration, we will write it again at the end, but let me complete the story because there is a subplot on how to solve this because that is something we have not discussed. After we construct Fock matrix at every iteration, you have to solve this equation, okay. So, the problem with this equation is that the original basis sets are not orthogonal, not orthonormal or orthogonal. So, that was the problem and that is the reason it did not become an eigenvalue equation. If they were orthonormal, then this S would have become unit matrix, okay, and this would have been automatically an eigenvalue equation. So, the strategy to do that is actually to orthogonalize the basis set. So, I have started with some matrices A, the, the, the basis sets A, A mu. I want to now construct a new basis let us say A nu prime which is orthonormal. Okay. The original matrices are not ortho, orthonormal. In fact, they are actually not orthogonal to be more precise. They can be normalized to unity by itself, but their overlap is not one, 0. That is the problem. Overlap with each other with different mu and nu is not 0. So, we now want to construct a new A mu prime which is orthonormal from the original set and then we will see how does that this equation look like and then we will worry about how to solve. So, so you construct A mu prime by a transformation as usual all if you have a basis you can transform to another basis by a transformation matrix. So, we will use a transformation matrix X. So, let us call it x nu mu a nu. So, this is the original matrices, original basis which are transformed by this transformation matrix x. Note the way the indices have been used. So, for, for the mu -th, mu -th vector a mu prime, 
the mu th column of x represents that vector. So, that is the only thing, it is a column because this is coming in the second index. So, that is the only thing that you have, you should be consistent whenever you write a matrix notation row and column. So, that is what we have been using. So, if I do this, then it is very clear that the original matrix was, original basis was not orthogonal, but the basis which I am generating are orthogonal. So, quite clearly this x cannot be unitary matrix. Remember a unitary matrix connects only ortho, orthogonal sets one orthogonal set, one orthonormal set, another orthonormal set. So, in this case of course, this matrix is connecting a non-orthonormal set to an orthonormal set and the matrix is actually not unitary. So, it is just to remember that because we always have this concept of transformation by unitary matrices. So, in this case x is not unitary. So, then we need to know what should be the character of x. What is unitary? Unitary essentially means x dagger x is identity. So, it is not of that character. So, what is the character of the x such that the mu prime set will become orthonormal? So, to analyze that, let us look at two the overlap of two prime, let us say a mu prime and a mu prime. So, this should become delta mu nu, correct. So, what I will do is to expand both left and the right hand side exactly like with this basis. However, remember with this uh, transformation, remember mu and nu are fixed index. So, when I use transformation, I must use different dummy indices. So, that you just remember. So, let us say for mu I am using sigma or whatever lambda, whatever lambda and another for sigma. So, I have two transformations, uh, two uh, transformations to make. So, one is this one. So, this will now become x, so it is mu. So, remember this will be lambda. So, it is x lambda mu star, the left side I am doing and here of course, you have got uh, a lambda, then I will write the rest. Then I am expanding this side. So, this will now become nu, this will become sigma. So, x sigma nu a sigma. Is it clear? Do not get confused with the mu and nu. I used here mu and nu, ah, but this nu can be sigma, lambda, anything depending on my requirement. Here of course, I cannot use mu and nu because these are my specific indices. So, the mu at 1, I am actually expanding by lambda. The dummy variable is lambda in this case. So, it becomes x lambda mu star. So, nu becomes lambda and a lambda goes here in the integration. Then this becomes now expansion of a nu prime. So, actually here everything has to change, mu has to become nu, this nu has to become sigma. So, this becomes x sigma nu a sigma, okay. Just remember this is an expansion. So, these indices, you have to understand the indices, that is all. No, you can actually expand this. So, this is the very important thing how to write this. Once you can write this correctly, then everything will be okay. So, you have to be very careful in writing this. So, now I will do a transformation in the following manner. x lambda mu star, I am going to write as a x dagger mu lambda, okay. It is a matrix. So, note that the x dagger mu lambda will be nothing but x lambda mu star. And then this is going to become the original overlap matrix between the A which I have already defined as S, right. So, this becomes S lambda sigma, correct. This is already defined as a overlap matrix in the original basis. And then I write the next X sigma nu. Remember these are all numbers, so I can turn them around any way I want, okay. Remember what I am doing is I am not doing matrix trans changes. Under lambda and sigma, these are numbers. So, I am just rewriting this expression all over again. Then you can see, now I have a matrix multiplication. This is a repeated index, correct. So, the whole thing can be written as x dagger s 
x mu nu. You all agree? Now I do the matrix multiplication because I have been able to bring the indices in correct order. Please remember this is a little, these are the little arithmetic that you have to keep doing in matrices. It is not very difficult. Now I can, I can say the entire, now I do not need to write the summation. Please remember because summation has been hidden under multiplication now, okay. So if you expand this, you will get this, mu nu. This one, my condition is that this should be delta mu nu, correct, because I want this to be orthonormal. So this gives me a condition on x, I was looking for the condition on x, I said x is not unitary. So what is the condition that the x satisfy, should satisfy such that the transform, transformation of this basis which is a non-orthonormal basis by the matrix A becomes orthonormal. So now I have got the condition quite clearly if x dagger Sx mu nu is delta mu nu, I can write that the x dagger Sx is an identity matrix, correct, with an identity matrix mu nu at element is a delta mu nu, agreed, okay, good. So once I know that my x dagger Sx must be identity matrix, I must now choose an x which will do the job and this is where there are several choices. So a popular choices, there are two popular choices, one is called the canonical. canonical choice, another is called the Lovedeans, which is actually symmetric and we are going to use that. So that is very simple that you assume that x is nothing but s to the power minus half. Now you see if I, if I just do a matrix x is matrix s to the power minus half, if I put it here quite clearly s is a Hermitian matrix, right. So x dagger is also Hermitian, so x dagger remains s to the minus half, this becomes s to the 1, this becomes s to the minus half, so overall it becomes s to the 0, correct. So if I put this here, then it is s to the minus half because x dagger is Hermitian, s, s to the minus half and that gives you s to the 0 which is identity. So essentially we need to choose a matrix such that it satisfies this. So obviously s to the minus half is Hermitian. So I can write x dagger uh, is as a s to the minus half and then quite clearly this x satisfies my condition where it gives an identity minus half plus 1 minus half, okay. Please remember it is not inverse, it is x dagger. So it is very important to understand because it is not unitary and again I am repeating because many people would write oh both of them cannot be minus half, this will be plus half, okay. So that is not true, that is only when it is unitary. So in fact, so x dagger is actually x is Hermitian matrix in this case, not unitary but Hermitian, the, by, by my choice but there can be other choices. So which I am not going to discuss, there is only one choice that I will discuss, I will probably mention another choice which is also very popular. But let us work with this x equal to x to the power minus half and with this I can now orthonormalize this basis set. I can go from a basis A to a basis A prime. So if that is so, then we can now continue. So next my problem is of course how do I calculate s to the minus half. I, I hope all of you know how to calculate function of a matrix. I did that did that in previous class in 4 to 5 probably, I do not know if I have done it here, but it is good to re remember that given any Hermitian matrix, you can find a function of that matrix. So one way to do that, so if I have a, let us say any a to the power n, do not multiply a many, many times, but diagonalize a, okay, that will be unitary transformation. So u dagger a u will become a diagonal a d let us say diagonal matrix, then you can write easily that u dagger a to the power n u is nothing but a d to the power n, 
okay and in general any u dagger function of a u would be function of ad so to calculate this function of a now you do reverse transformation u f of ad u dagger because u is unitary so this will become identity this will become identity you will have only f of a the trick is that since ad is a diagonal to find ad to the power n is very simple all you have to do is to make nth power of the diagonal elements and then you do back transformation if it is a complicated function you just take that complicated function of the diagonal elements whatever that is very easy a number so for example if i have s to the minus half it is very difficult to do a matrix to the power minus half how will you do matrix to the power minus half okay but what you can do is to diagonalize this matrix s matrix to get a diagonal sd and then take inverse of the diagonal matrix that is very easy because all you take is inverse of the eigen values okay and then back transform okay so calculation of x itself is a task remember it's a there are many many sub tasks that you am discussing after i have now got a x, x the task is to calculate x but let's say that you know how to calculate x but that sub task now i am just writing a simple algorithm diagonalize s which means i know u and diagonal s which is eigen values matrix but diagonal right then calculate sd to the power minus half that is that is cheap a diagonal matrix to the inverse is very easy just take inverse of all the diagonal elements right reconstruct then do a back transform u u dagger that's your s to the power minus half. so this is a small task that you must allow the computer to perform to get x and remember this is very useful even if you are taking a 100 power of a matrix that can be constructed as a function don't multiply the matrix 100 times it is much easier to diagonalize this matrix once and then take 100 power of this function s to the power 100 let's say that is very quick because it's only eigen values 100 power of a number is very quick and then back transform one more transformation only one so I can give you a sine of a, cosine of a, any power series like s to the minus half is a power series. You do not have to bother about this because since it is true for every power of n, since the function can always be expanded in a power series, it is true for in general for a function of a. So that is the whole argument. So after that you just apply this. So that makes it very nice idea again you know borrowing from something which mathematicians knew. Then, then take the inverse square root of SD and then back transform. So, this is the basically the step and I have written it down, it is very simple. Okay, I have not written down calculate SD to the power minus half, but that is obvious. That is a very obvious step uh, to do that and that is the cheapest step, diagonal element you can take any function. And then of course, uh, yeah, back transform, this is called the back transform because you had u dagger on the left now u dagger comes on the right so that's why i'm calling it back transform and back transform essentially gives you the this part out okay so this is a small part that you have to do i will not write s to the minus half anymore i'm going to write the equation now in terms of x the reason is i can use some other x okay labdin orthogonalization is one choice but there may be some other x. So, right now I will make it general. Whatever x I use, remember x dagger sx must be identity. That is important. So, this is something that we have to remember. That that is a condition. That x, x dagger x must be identity. So, let me now <coughs> say that I know this matrix x. So, the, the, the point that I discuss right now is only to tell you that I know how to orthonormalize this. What is the x? Whatever is the x, I have given you one choice, there can be other choices and there are many, many choices you can discuss, but that is not important. Uh, most of the time the symmetric s to the minus half is used in most programs. So I just told you the most popular choice. So x dagger sx is identity matrix 
and then let us see what happens to this equation. If that is my main concern. How do I solve the equation with this? So, with after knowing this x which transformed A to A prime basis, I now want to define a few quantities. So, for example, I first want to go back to the equation SCE. Remember, this is of course an I diagonal matrix which contains the orbital energies as in the diagonal elements that is something that I need to find out and I do not know the coefficients. I multi pre multiply this matrix x with f uh, with x dagger. So, I write this equation as x dagger S C T. So, that is the first task I do. Now that I know x matrix, I pre multiply with x dagger. Then what I do is to insert here an identity in the following manner and insert here also an identity in the following manner x dagger f x x inverse c. This is an identity x x inverse quite clearly because x is not unitary, but x x inverse is always identity by definition. So, there is one small assumption that this x whatever x I choose I have lots of x's to choose, but this x must be non singular. Even when I calculate s to the power minus half, it is very clear that it may become non sing may become singular under the condition if one of the eigenvalues of s become 0. Because remember when I am doing s d to the power minus half, they are the eigenvalues of the s. s I am diagonalizing s, I wrote in that side line, I am diagonalizing s. See one of the eigenvalues become 0, then I cannot take inverse square root to the power minus half. So, such a situation occurs. It provided the basis there is a dependence in the basis. So, that means your basis has not been properly chosen. Then you have to go back and clean up your basis, throw out the depend, dependent terms and then come back. Now, usually we know how to do this. Today's basis sets we know how to do that. So, I have started with this original equation which I have to solve. Pre multiply by x dagger from the left. Then after between f and c and between s and c, I have introduced an identity x x inverse. Is it okay? Then I define a new quantity x inverse c. So, let us define x inverse c as c prime. Note that since x is a non singular matrix, x inverse exists. I can calculate x inverse and I can define a new coefficient matrix. Remember our C was a coefficient matrix which, which gave the molecular orbitals in terms of the atomic orbitals or A basis. Now, I have a new transformation matrix. In fact, very, very quickly you will see that this is the transformation matrix where the same molecular orbitals are expanded in terms of the prime basis the C prime ok. So, it is a so it is it is like I looked at the molecular orbitals in terms of the original atomic orbital. So, I had this coefficient which connects. Now, I am looking at the molecular orbitals same molecular orbitals in terms of the transformed basis A prime. The one that connects is C prime. So, it is like looking at an object with a green specs another ob same object with the yellow specs. So, the matrix has become different which transform. So, same so same molecular orbitals are transformed by from A by C matrix and they will be transformed from A prime by C prime matrix. So, that will be the essential argument of this C prime in a, uh, 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 um, the physical interpretation. But right now let me define C prime and define F prime as a new matrix X dagger F X which is very easy to do because as soon as I construct F. I can always write x dagger f x because x is known, x is known. So, I can do that. So, I have defined this, I have defined a new matrix this. This is an identity by, by definition of x. So, quite clearly I can now write an equation f prime, right? This is f prime, this is f prime, c prime equal to c prime e. 
who is just gives beautifully an eigenvalue equation. Okay. So, all the prime that I have written is the same equation projected in the prime basis. This equation is projected in the A basis, original basis, I projected in the prime basis. So, now I know how to write the equation. The problem is that I cannot have f, I have a projected f which is a prime. That is the only thing, but that is not a big deal. All I need to do in my SCF step is to add one more step. When I construct x, after that reconstruct a prime because x is known. And note x, x has to be calculated only once, it is s to the minus half. So, do it outside the iteration, right? Only once I have to calculate x. Then I do a prime and then I diagonalize. I will write down the entire step. Once I diagonalize, I get c prime. But then I do not know how to construct f prime from c prime. But does not matter, I will go back to c by a reverse transformation. So, c is x c prime, pre multiply by x, right? So, x x inverse becomes identity. So, c is x c prime. Once I know c prime, I reconstruct c, I reconstruct f because rather I reconstruct p first, then reconstruct f, go back to f prime, diagonalize, keep doing it. So, I have just added a few more steps. I am going to write down the entire step now, but I hope it is clear, okay? That I just go back to the orthonormal basis and then come back to my original non orthonormal basis, construct f because that is where my f is known, f is known in terms of the original basis. So, I construct that, then I again make my new f, re-diagonalize, get the new c, reconstruct the old c, old p, old f, go back to the new basis f prime, diagonalize, keep doing it. You just have to remember the steps, it is very easy. Okay, I am going to write down the entire steps of course now, but I am just explaining first. So, once you do that, so you get c prime, from c prime you get c which is x c prime and then once you have c, construct p from the c and then eventually f okay, and then back to f prime and then go back. Yeah, if you write an expression of f prime with respect to c prime, but then all these x daggers will anyway come, it is not a big deal. Yeah, same thing in a more complicated way. So, I am basically dividing the steps, computationally it is always better. Like if you multiply three matrices, you write two matrices first, then multiply the third matrix. I hope all of you know this, computationally you, you never multiply three matrices, you never write sum over lambda, sigma, even, even this that I wrote once that uh, you know I showed you uh, something like x mu, I do not remember, uh, x, uh, x, yeah, x mu sigma, x dagger mu sigma, s sigma mu, whatever, x, uh, x mu lambda, whatever, you do not, you can write anything you want. So, when you summing over, never sum all of them at a time, I, I write in algebra, it is okay. But when you sum, you sum these two, then sum this. So, bring only one index at a time, summation index. I hope all of you know this is a very simple computer tricks that we always use. So, one way to explain, explain that is to gen, make a generally three matrices. Let us say I am writing D equal to ABC. So, your expression is Dij equal to sum over Aik, Bkl, Clj, right? sum over k l. Let us say it is m dimensional problem. If I start all the loops together when I write a computer program, for every i j I have a summation over k l. So, for every i j how many steps I have to do apart from the multiplication? This multiplication has to be done m square times, correct? Because k is 1 to m, l is also 1 to m. And then I have to construct m square number of coefficients like that. So, the entire process is called m to the power 4. I think you have to understand these, these nomenclatures. So, it is m to the power 4 because to construct the entire matrix D, I have to do m to the power 4 steps. Within each step, of course, there is a multiplication, but that is, that is not I am bothered. On the other hand, you can break it down. 
you can first construct AB. So, if you do this AB multiplication, how many steps will be there by the same definition? MQ, correct? Because you have only one summation in AB. Then multiply C, you will have another M cube, but M cube plus M cube is much less than M to the power 4 because it is only 2 times M cube. So, large M, it is much less than M to the power 4. So, that is a strategy. So, this becomes actually proportional to M cube, not M to the power 4. So, by a very simple trick, you can bring down the computer time. So, when you ask people to write computer program, there is a first thing I give multiply 3 matrices. Now, those who have learned Fortran, they will first start doing do i equal to something, do j equal to something, do k equal to something, do l equal to something, write it down. That is the easiest thing to write. D of i comma j equal to a of i comma k into b of k comma l. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, program is over. Bad program. Program is okay. It will give correct results. So, you have to understand that is not the program we are looking for in high performance computing. But that is a that is a good thing to start with. If even somebody can write that, I will be happy initially. Then you learn, why do you write? Then you learn that these matrices are sparse. Most of the elements are 0. So then how will you do it? I give you only the non-zero elements and their indices. Now write down a program. That is much more, much harder. You cannot have a loop drive. Do I, do J, that will not work. Random numbers are given which are only non-zeros, whose indices are given to you both for both A, B, C, for all three A, B, C or A, B, whatever, multiply them. Now, that is a harder problem. So, I am trying to uh, give to my students, <laughs> they are struggling. So, that is a harder problem actually to do. But then only you will realize how to do because that is a sparse matrix. Because most of the quantum chemistry matrices are sparse. So, you do not unnecessarily multiply 0 times something. Just to get 0, you do not do work when you know it is 0. Any one of them is 0 is going to 0, become 0. So, you do not even go through that. But that is the second level of problem. But initially remember that the multiplication itself is a, is a challenging task. So, what you are telling is essentially I can do that, but all these multiplications will be involved. So, better to break it down. Hmm. All right. So, then we each time we go into the loop, we have to also find an exit now when it has converged. And I have been discussing that. Quite clearly, a convergence test can be done directly with the C if the coefficients have converged or, or conversely if density matrix has converged. So, I construct the density matrix, I can directly write density matrix. So, one of the ways to do that is to construct the density matrix at the nth iteration, this nth iteration mu nu. Compare with the earlier iteration, mu nu, right? Mod square, sum over all mu common. Element by element you compare with the mod square. Why mod square is important? That makes it positive. That is important because otherwise you may get 0 because one element is highly positive, different, another is negative, but all both of them are wrong. They have to actually convert the right value. So, take mod square, this number should be less than some delta or epsilon or so delta is a very small quantity. If, if this is so, then it is converged. So, that is my exit policy. So, then I will exit from Hartree-Fock. That means, I am satisfied. Now, your Hartree-Fock is as accurate as your delta, of course. If you put a very high delta, then you will exit very quickly and somebody will put a very low delta, get a better Hartree-Fock. Now, typically these numbers are 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 9, you know, typically. But, you know, this can, you have to be very careful when you write a Hartree-Fock program. Many times your program has more or less converged. This has come up to 10 to the minus 7, but you have put a delta which is 10 to the minus 12. It will never come that low. So, program is running stupidly. And finally, it will say after 200 iterations, it has not converged. But actually, it is it, almost converged. Numerically, you never get 0. Remember, numerically, so, it is because you are not paying attention and unfortunately many people do that in the old days when they used to give input. Today of course, your canned programs like Gaussian takes care. It is quite intelligent, so it sets everything and it, it will even tell you if it has not converged, why it has not converged, reset the delta in this manner and then do it, but that is not good, you know, you should, people should learn on their own. 
why it is happening, look at the output. Those skills are unfortunately vanishing, very few people have. In, in, in a real learning program, there is no other option. We have to make it converge. So, you have to first understand why is it not converging. If it is going down and down, but it is not reached 10 to the minus 11, it is reached 10 to the minus 10 in 200 iteration. We will take another 50 iteration to reach 10 to the minus 11, it is not important. That is an acceptable value in terms of number of digits. You can stop it. Okay. So, that is a kind of judgment that you have to make. Computer will of course print that it has not converged because that is what you have asked it to print. Okay, because you have given the delta, if it has not reached, it will not, it will say not convert. And then you go and report to your supervisor, no, 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 the SCF is not working, it is not converge. So that is very bad. You know, that is where I expect all students to look at it, why it has not converged. So look at the output of a program very carefully. And then you yourself can change it many times. You do not have to bother. And the, and the same thing will happen for geometry optimization, many, many things. It is, this is only SCF optimization, any iterative steps, this will happen. So this is my convergence test, okay. So if I understand the convergence test, I can now write down the, all the steps in a, in a, in a way that will, that will give you the Hartree-Fock program. And that is what is done uh, in all the uh, program except the one thing that I have not discussed is how to even choose the original basis A. The basis of atomic orbitals, I will come down, come back later. So let us say that I know how to choose it. So, right for, so the initial thing is of course the step one is to choose your geometry. Because everything is Born-Oppenheimer approximation, so it is a BO. So I am going to define my Born-Oppenheimer electronic Hamiltonian by choosing the geometry which essentially means choose the nuclear coordinate. There is nothing else about geometry, where the nuclei are. Once I do that, my second point is to choose the basis in that geometry, so choose my MU. Then calculate the 1 and 2 electron integrals. I hope all of you know what is 1 and 2 electron integrals by now. Everything in atomic orbital basis. So there is no molecular orbitals. Molecular orbitals will come in terms of the coefficients and in terms of the p matrix. So it is all going to be hidden there. So calculate 1 and 2 electron integrals in AO basis, this atomic orbital basis and then guess p, p mu nu in atomic orbital. Now usually you will say I have no clue now to the coefficients, how do I guess? So one of the guess could be make it 0, which means f will be nothing but h core mu nu to start with, okay. So, then you construct F, whatever is your guess, construct F. Note that now F is available in terms of P already. I have given the expression. So, construct F. Once I have construct F, now I come to the SCF equation. So, now I know what I have to do. I have already told you that I must construct X first. So, I have to add steps here. When I say calculate 1 and 2 electron integrals, the one electron integrals also involve X, S, overlap matrix. So calculate one and two electron integrals and X, whatever be that X P, okay. So this requires some step because you have S, S, remember overlap integral is also a one electron integral, just like H core. So all one and two electron integrals S, but if you want to write this, you can write separately that even here I can write calculate overlap S and X, which means S to the power minus half, okay. And calculate rest of them. If I do that, then I do not have to write this. I can make this step 3, you know, that is my choice. I can make this step 4, step 5, step 6. That is unimportant, what is the number. Once I have done this, now construct F prime, which is X dagger F X. But now I know X, I know F, construct this and then diagonalize. I will only say diagonalize. If I diagonalize F prime, my output is C prime, eigenvectors. So when I diagonalize, I get eigenvalues, C prime and E. So when I diagonalize F prime, I get C prime 
with that C prime I construct C. So, diagonal is A prime, the output is C prime and of course E, but E is not important at this stage. I am going to look at E only when it is converged. I reconstruct C back. I look at the MO in the old basis and then construct P again because if a C has changed, then P must change, correct? Then the step 11 is to subject it to the convergence test. Now, convergence test because I have constructed P here, which is my guess, okay, later on it will be constructed and I have constructed P. So, compare between the earlier and this iteration. So, basically I will just say do a convergence test, okay. Then if it is successful, of course, it will never be successful after first iteration, but I am generally writing exit and then print all the things. Once you exit, you had E, everything, now all the outputs you print, coefficient, everything. If not, which is of course, initially that is what is going to happen, you have to now go back to, I have got my P, so go back to step C, 6. Okay. Step 6 is now construction of F, again reconstruct F prime, again diagonalize, reconstruct C, reconstruct P, again do a convergence stress. If successful, this is my exit. Remember, other loop will continue. If not, go to step 6. There is another way you have exit. That is, if your number of times you do that is more than 100, more than 200 exit, which is what I just now said. And then it, computer just prints, oh, I failed, you know, I did a lot of hard work. I couldn't, 100 means I have done a lot of hard work, okay. But, you know, I am not writing that part, but eventually, you know, I, I failed, okay. So, which could be for many, many reasons. So, you go to step 6 and of course, continue. Continue till again you come to step 12. This more or less now summarizes the entire SCF step. And as, if you understand, you know how to write program, you would actually be able to write an algorithm at least, if not program, in a flow chart. I mean, those who have done, done little bit of programming, there is something called flow chart. You do these box. How to do each of them is a different matter and uh, it becomes complete thing. However, we have to come back and discuss this. This is very important. How do I choose? I have left it right now blank. Uh, so, I, but today I thought I will discuss with you uh, this part. It's very, very important to remember. Please also look at this projection operator. It is very important to look at the, the, uh, this, sorry, this uh, um, charge density bound order. It is not a projection operator. Charge density bound order, which I had written down as sum over i equal to 1 to n by 2, 2 c mu i star, uh, sorry, 2 c mu c nu i star, okay. Just, just reflect on this matrix. I am going to come back in the next class to discuss properties of the charge density bound order matrix, which I have just written, but there are some interesting properties that I will look at. Question is that, is it an idempotent matrix? There are lots of questions we will do. I, I already was telling that project, is it a projection operator? Okay. So, you have to see. It is a matrix, however. These two are vectors. In fact, in a matrix form, you can write this as 2 C C dagger. We will see how to look at that. As I think it looks obvious the way I have written P mu nu because you have to sum. The sum now is over the molecular orbital. So, that is why this is a very interesting matrix because here the coefficient would be 2 C mu. The second index is the molecular orbital. C is the only one which is a connection with the atomic and molecular orbital, remember. So, that is a very interesting thing, 2 C mu i, C dagger i nu, which is C nu i star. So, if you see this matrix is actually 2 C C dagger and <coughs> we can look at whether this, whether it is it important or not. So, if you do P square, what will you get? You will get 4 C C dagger C C dagger. Clearly, it is not it important. Clearly not an idempotent matrix. 
So, what is the properties of the matrix? I will come back and discuss about P, very interesting matrix. Uh, right now, I have left it as just a mathematics construct because this is there will be a lot of there will be a lot of uh, interpretation of uh, this matrix because this is where I said physically Mulliken analysis, bond order, a lot of things will go. So, we will have to explain that. So, we will come back to that, but please go through these steps if you have any doubt because this is something again not very typical, it is not taught most of the classes and uh, we will also discuss later any other ways of going x, but that is not important. I think we will stick to mostly s to the minus up and remember how do you construct x that is very important s to the minus half diagonalize s. So, that is another step here. So, you can keep on building more and more steps that is of course, 100 steps you can build each has a sub task. So, you have to diagonalize s then you can say that get unitary transformation do s d to the power minus half back transform. So, each step has many many sub tasks. So, that number of steps you can write as many as you want to write. Okay, but I mean that I think matter should be very clear that each of them is a sub task and you know you know this is something where you can actually start programming. You start writing f, so you become boss you know after some time. So, <laughs> you can break down and give and give it to the students and then start assembling. Programming is very important after that you assemble all the modules and of course, they have to have similar symbols these all that. But I think the re reason I am writing it down that this can actually be a st step to program apart from just knowing the theory, you can actually look at all the steps total SCF. These programs are also available on parallel machine today. That means, many processors are run together, but if you are do only on single processor, okay, sequential codes, 100 bases, it, it a good Intel, you know, depends on what is your CPU top of the line CPU, you know this very complicated question, loaded questions, it may not even take one minute. Then what do you mean by run the code, write the code that depends on you, <laughs> that completely depends on you right. Per atom today we use maybe 25, 30, 35, depends on what if it is a heavy atom or even more. That we will discuss when you discuss the basis here, how to choose them, okay. But yeah, writing the code, how long time it takes, it depends. Writing does not take time, the debugging takes time. For sure, if you are going to write a code, it is not going to give results. You can, I can, you can try a simple matrix multiplication, it does not give you results. In the big, I do not know how many have written, you will get something 0 because something is not defined. So, that is another issue, program writing. I do not want to convert this into writing program. In fact, I was very tempted to take a course on computer programming actually in chemistry, but there is no course actually, you know, and it is so complicated. Yeah, but how, where? Which code? Number? You tell me the number. 504. 504? Huh? 504. 485. Is that right? Yeah. So, nobody takes it now? Who, who is checking it? So, it is taught? These are taught? Achha, these are taught? No. Huh. I mean, basic four track. Yeah, but if you, yeah, if you know, then you, you should be able to write some of this. But the, as, as I told you, even to construct this, you have to be careful. X dagger fx is again construction. F prime mu nu, x dagger mu sigma, f sigma lambda, x lambda nu, right? Again, three multi multiplication. You have to do break it up two, two. So every step you have to be very careful. Okay. So I just want to tell you that I, if you expand every step, now you can see that there are so many things to do. That is why I am saying every step can be a small computer problem. MSc student, one, almost each step. You know, if somebody has to just construct S and then get X, that itself is a good project. You have to diagonalize, back transform, do S D to the power minus R, back transform, construct X. It is not going to be easy. Yeah? You think it is easy? You try it as a project. <laughs> okay, I will give you overlap matrices, you try. And if you have to construct the overlap matrix, okay, it will take you one, one or two years. 
from the basis because you have to understand how to write in terms of Gaussian, these, that's far more complicated, okay? All right, so that's, uh, I think we'll like, uh, close here.